Hello everybody, welcome to the Alexi Sale podcast number 19. Now, our last podcast with Saul Williams, I think was probably the least listened to <laughs> podcast ever. Uh, where Saul Williams, the dancer, choreographer, musician, talking about his esoteric uh, non-linear mov- uh, movie about coltan mining. <laughs> Uh, I, I think that that, uh, you know, it was amazing. I thought it was fascinating and amazing conversation. But it turns out that I think uh, my listeners like either me being shitty about Keir Starmer or uh, the, the Neolithic age of comedy. <laughs> so in, in, in a desperate attempt to claw back some listeners, I am this week with Lisa Mayer, the co-writer of The Young Ones. Yes, The Young Ones, Young Ones, Young Ones. <laughs> Get in there, all you, 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 you uh, comedy nerds. Listen to my podcast, uh, please. And uh, so, yeah, Lisa Mayer, uh, co-writer of The Young Ones, and I think we're going to claw back, not probably not get quite up to Jeremy Corbyn levels, but, uh, you know. You never know. We might you never, yeah, it might worse. be more. Might be more. Especially as you started out by calling me a Neanderthal, I suppose. No, no, no. I, did, I, was saying, I didn't. I don't think it was people who were interested in the Neolithic, Neolithic period of uh, alternative comedy. So now lots of people are going to write in and say, actually, Neanderthals uh, didn't live in the yeah, Neolithic era. They were pre-Neolithic in the period. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't care. No. Um, that's the thing. <laughs> you really don't care, do you? No. That's your, uh, your defining feature. It is. It's, <laughs> I could have, <laughs> if I'd been a thirties comedian, I could have had that on my on my card. Lexi Sale, he doesn't care. <laughs> Fuck you. Uh, so, Lisa. Anyway, would you like to talk a bit about the genesis of the Young Ones? Really, since as you, you with you and I think Rick Mayo um, came up with the idea, or. The genesis, okay, the genesis of the young ones was um, twofold. One, that we had recently been students um, and therefore were um, very steeped in the memories of being students. And the other was that um, the comic strip had just started and Rick had a character called Rick. (laughs) (laughs) Kids, you don't get this kind of comedy these days. The the big innovation was that his character Rick was spelt differently from his name, right? And I think maybe he always distinguished in his mind between his comic persona, his comic persona, yeah, him by putting a C in the name of his comic persona, right? And um, his comic persona, he he personally had the more pretentious spelling of his name, whereas his comic persona had the more. But anyway, apparently it. That stemmed from when he was a kid and and was a fan of Eric the Viking. So oh, right. he was supposed to he took the sea out. Okay, but it was a bit. <laughs> he took something out. Oh. It was anyway. a bit like um, those girls who used to have names that ended in I and put a little heart over the I. Yeah. Anyway, so yeah, so um, I I could go back. The first time I met you was actually in the at the cut the old comedy store, which was in the strip club, That's wasn't right. it? And one well, thing, several things about you that you were, you were, you were fabulous. <laughs> you also always had a full pack of fags. <laughs> and I remember you had little pixie boots, which people were wearing then. And I was reading this book called David Mayer is a Mother. <laughs> and you said, that's my dad's name. I think that's the first thing you said to me. <laughs> um, and but we, we, we very soon, me, you, and Rick became. Very close friends, didn't we? Yeah, well, well, what I remember about you is that there was one very tiny dressing room with one very <laughs> tiny sink, yeah. and no one was allowed to use the sink because you used to come and fill it with ice and then put your drink in. My lord, the and the reason for that was that Paul Raymond used to. This was late, this was at the comic strip day. You've got to. Oh, yes, you're right. The, that yeah, wasn't you see, they're, they're going to see all kinds of discrepancies. Oh, the letters that were. Uh, yeah, I think people write letters anymore. But, but um, yeah, no, this was the comic strip. There was a. Because Paul Raymond used to charge us for drinks, and so I used to buy six cup price lagers at. Uh, Supermarket, and then yes, I used to put them in the sink with ice, so no one could so shave, wash, could wash their makeup. Yeah, <laughs> Dawn and Jen. Well, it was Dawn and Jennifer's dressing room. It was the girls' dressing no, room. No, they were next door. No, I'm sure. And, I... they, and also, they were later. No, they were at the comic strip. You see, you're getting everything. No, I wrong. don't mean. Oh, you're late, right. They did come later. Yeah, 
the later era of the comics book. I think people are going to be yearning for Saul Williams at this rate. Um, yeah, I agree. <laughs> thank so God, anyway. Thank God for editors. No, you you went back to when we'd first met. Oh, I did. That's true. Yeah. Anyway, Paul Jackson, who was a young producer who was known for um, the two Ronnies and who had heard that there were interesting things happening in comedy and had come down to see it and did a program called Boom Boom Out Go The Lights, which was various people from the comedy store and the comic strip doing their acts on a TV program. Yeah. And then um, because it was on the BBC at the time, it was so heavily edited that virtually nothing of the original comedy remained. And so Rick and I were um, talking about this and, and saying, you know, what what – should be on television. There, have, there are a few things which are meant to be on television. One, you know, like a nature documentary and a sitcom. You know, and the form is a TV form. And so um, we were talking about his character Rick, who was an angry poet, and what he would have been like as a student, and the students that we knew who used to label their yogurts in the fridge and everything. And from that, it turned into the idea of doing a bunch of students in a flat. But because we were writing the parts for people that we knew who were at the, by then, the comic strip, we, um, and they were two double acts, and you, Alexi, the compare, that's why we had four, four male students and the landlord. Right. So you wrote, and you, so you... So we told Paul our idea. Yeah. And he went, great, I can get you 300 quid to write a pilot. Mm-hmm. Um, so we wrote the pilot. And um, and while, while Rick and I were writing the pilot, I had a job um, running the a pub theatre at a pub called The Old Red Lion. And, um, and Ben wandered in one night and... Um, with a play that he had written, wanting to put it on. And Rick was there. Um, ben had been a year below Rick at Manchester. Yeah, yeah so Ben so, wandered so in. So Ben wandered in wanting to do Isn't his play. Isn't it Mussolini or something? I, no, I have yeah. no idea. And um, because he wrote a play every two days, yeah, as far yeah. as I could tell. He was like Ernie Wise. Um, and, and I said, no, we can't put on your play. We don't actually put on plays. We, you know, we only do like plays you. that other people have, have got yeah. productions of. Um, and Rick was like, oh, well, Ben's a really good writer. Why don't we get him to do this with us? And so it, it was the tenor of, you know, everything then was like, yeah, sure, why not? Let's do it. So, so then Ben became involved. And he did, in all fairness, bring some, uh, something to the party. Yeah. And, um, and then uh, we filmed the pilot. And they commissioned... In, that would be in... When was that? Because I that remember... Was winter, because it was yeah. so cold. And we shot it in Holloway, didn't we? And it was... So that in, was the... And that was before That was before we went to... So that was that 1981. That was the winter of 1981. What I most remember, so I, I, for some reason, I think because there was snow on the ground, I decided that it would be a good idea to wear Wellington boots. And I mm. thought that my toes had frostbite. I was so cold. <laughs> Um, and we had that scene where Neil was crucifying himself on the outside of the house, and that was so cold. Yeah. There's that scene. I mean, there's a whole scene at a bus stop, isn't there, with Pauline and Maggie Steed, where um, is that in the... When the plane's going to crash. Yeah, and I, is, am I menacing them with a with an umbrella? Because yeah. that was a reference to Georgi Georgi. I mean, it was, it's, it's amazingly really obscure, obscure even then. But if, for those real, if somebody wants to get really deep into it, I'm menacing them with an umbrella, and that's a reference to Georgi Markov, who was poisoned, <laughs> a Bulgarian dissident who was poisoned with rice in a Waterloo Bridge. But there's a great line where Paul, I see Pauline says when they're on the top of the bus, what oh, what that boy needs is a good wank. <laughs> yes. You wrote that? Is that you? I don't know. I remember very pretentiously when he's when he's on but they the ding, they put a bell when ding in the, Rick's crucified on the front of the house and yeah. he and he goes house 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 oh you are made of stone which was supposed to be a reference to King Lear which probably <laughs> absolutely no one has ever yeah. got ever. But you were amazing even in the pilot and then in the I suppose we can so they I remember what, so we went. 
The comic, comic strip went to tour Australia. We went to the Adelaide Festival, didn't we, in yeah. March or April 1982. And you, when the Falklands War broke out. When the Falklands War broke out, exactly, because we were away. We're and so yeah, we old. left. Yeah. And you, were, you, you came out and you and Rick, which while we were all sunning ourselves. Yeah, we with had, the Pina Bausch Dance Company. That's another story for another day. We were you locked were, in yeah. the hotel room writing the rest of the series. Writing the rest of the series. Right from the start, I mean, what's, um, you know, what's still so impressive about The Young Ones is the, um, you yeah, the creativity of it, the fact that there are no bands. Well, the one you brilliantly decon. I mean, you, it was right, really, because I was the first one to be on telly, really. But what? I'd just been doing my act, but with the kind of swear words taken out. Whereas what you realised was that what you needed to be on telly was a TV form, yeah. which you then deconstructed, as it were. But we uh, all, we sort of, I don't know how intentional it was or whether it was just how can we get everything into this format that we want to get into it. So we got the idea of having the cutaways and being able to go off into sort of sketches. That was amazing. I mean, you see something like Family Guy uses mm. that. But, I mean, this is, you know, 1981, 1982. I mean, it's spectacularly original. And then, the, I mean, the well, the bands, well, we, we'll do that story later, although I think a lot of people know that. But also, um, yeah, the puppets, I mean, do you think it was partly that you were, yeah, because you didn't, what was that, because you telling me about how you didn't, you didn't know how to get from one scene to another scene? Oh, well, scene? yeah, that I hadn't realised that, it, you know, you can be, have a scene in the kitchen and then you can write cut to the bedroom. Yeah. So I'd think, oh, they're all in the kitchen, so they have to go, we have to do something on the stairs on the way to the bedroom. And so there'd be a scene on the stairs. And so some of it was just... Yeah, you know, being too literal about getting people from one place to another, um, and and sort of s- sticking extra things in that you wouldn't, you know, a lot of a lot of the good things we did we did by accident, right? And then in the first series we learned a lot of things, so we couldn't do them by accident in the second series. So in the second series, it was actually a lot slicker and more professional but didn't have and had other things mm. but then it, it a the lot of the sort of raw edges were yeah. gone yeah yeah because you can't um you can't fake that no you can't no you can't unknow the things no. that you know no anyway. exactly um so what, what and what was your i mean how did it all seem to you the whole experience um, also well actually i suppose we could also the fact that you i mean very you were very and still are, to some extent, a woman in television comedy. Well, yeah, I would probably answer that differently now than when people asked me then, because right. then they would say, you know, what's it like to be a woman in comedy? And I'd go, well, I don't know, because I've never been a man in comedy. You know, I'm just a person. But looking back on it, you know, it was appalling, some of the things that happened, you know, that I'd be in, we'd be in a reading the script through the first time and someone would ask me to go and make the teas and stuff. Right. And I used to tell them to fuck off. Yeah. But they would still, those things happened. You know, there was a a story that I told about when, we, when we'd done the first series and you got, if you'd done a series at the BBC, you got invited to the Christmas party, which was a, you know, a kind of big deal because all the, the f- people that you'd ever seen on television would be there. And you'd go to the sixth floor and have a, a glass of warm champagne and a canopy. Mm, yeah. And um, they sent the invitations out and I didn't get an invitation. And I complained and they said, oh, well, you don't need an invitation because Rick's got a plus one on his invitation so you can come with him. So I said, I'm sorry, I, that's not good enough. I want my own invitation. So they sent me an invitation with and my then you plus got, one. Then you got your <laughs> revenge because? Well, I didn't intend to get my <laughs> revenge. I just invited um, our flatmate, um, the lovely Roland Riveron, yes, who, and... um, who came and got incredibly drunk and um, got, <laughs> got aid drunk as well. Yeah. And he... Went into the kitchen, stole some cutlery. I mean... I I got a letter from the BBC saying never bring him again. Really? Because we because they we were trusted as well because 
I think they could. They invited us because it was a big deal. The Ellie Christmas party wasn't mm-hmm. it? Really, because you know Warren Mitchell was there and the mm-hmm. cast of Dad's Army and uh, you know Val Dunican and, and um, uh, they the, the, they hadn't invited any new young comedians since they'd invited the Pythons and they'd turned up in jeans. <laughs> and I think that they knew that we were more reliable than that because we were. Comedians, we and we respected certain aspects. Yeah. Of, I think of the tradition, and so we knew. So I didn't wear a, I didn't wear a dinner jacket, but I did wear a suit and tie and stuff because I thought that was just respectful. So it was you that ruined it for us all. Right? I mean, they invited. They still kept inviting us. I, I remember being worried though about meeting people that you'd want to take the piss out of in some way, and then you couldn't if you got yeah. to know them and became friends with them yeah. or, or found that they were nice as people, you know, that, that it That's, sort of took yeah. your edge off. Absolutely. It's the eternal problem. So, um, to, so how, to how, I mean, how was the, what was the, the making of... Uh, um, people say, was it fun? It was fun. It was fun. Yeah. I mean, I was always frustrated, and in those days... Um, you it was very unionised and you had to stop dead on 10 o'clock when you were filming and we never, ever managed to... We had so much to pack in and we tried to do as much as possible in the studio because we realised that things on film weren't as funny as things on video. Mm-hmm. And in those days when you did outside broadcast, they did it on film. And there's something... Although I think by the I end, didn't, by didn't the end, we end. got to do it on we Did insisted it on, on we doing had, it on tape. Yeah, we had an OB scanner. I yeah, think, I remember. Yeah, but I, but I'm not sure we did it at the very beginning, like in the Probably pilot and things. Mil, yeah. And there's just something about film which makes everything a bit more beautiful and therefore a bit less funny. And also in terms of the comic timing, when you're playing in um, stuff that you've already filmed, it doesn't work in the same way that performing in front of an audience does. And I think all the performers in the young ones were very much live performers and, you know, who weren't really used to doing, working to a camera, but who responded really well to a studio audience. And those, I mean, I do remember that those, um, uh, those studio recordings. So we would do, we would do what they call pre-records when we were on a Thursday. That would be all the, Stuff like with lions and what have you that we couldn't do. Yeah, before. and we'd have done the outside broadcast. Yeah. And then occasionally we could record a bit of the dress rehearsal on the, right. on the ah, studio okay. day. And then we would do the live recording with the audience. And then we would have to finish at 10 or, as always happened, because I used to be in the gallery, Paul would have to ring down to the basement where the VT engineers were and negotiate with them to get an extra 15 minutes right? so that we could overrun. Right. And um, and then we'd usually overrun, but that was it. And then and then it would, if you hadn't finished, it would just, that was it, cut off. And then when you were editing, because, it, again, it wasn't digital, you could only do kind of one generation of edits. Right. So you couldn't kind of look at an edit that someone had done and go, can you just fiddle with this, this and this, because you would lose quality in it. So there was always stuff that I wasn't happy with or wished we could do again, do another take, re-edit or anything, but it, but it just had to be the way it was. And, you know, and maybe in retrospect that could, you know, contributed to the roughness as well. But those nights as well, that we we would then go to the BBC bar, wouldn't we? Which was mm, yeah. Which is I've got very fond memories. Which well, I seemed, don't because that's where I used to get groped. That's, that's where you re- really noticed yeah, being a female the, at the where, BBC. Yeah. Well, I yes, I can only apologise for at the time. <laughs> for your gender. Yeah, absolutely. But uh, at the time, it seemed very exciting because to be, you know, showgirls in there. You know, <laughs> yeah. You know. Yeah. In the feather plumage that they'd just done, well, it was, some variety to be show. Fair, they were probably having a worse time than I was. <laughs> I'm sure they were. And uh, they, they, sometimes, if it was, a, a, you know, some some band had been there, and um, it was all, it all seemed very. Yeah. And then we go to that Indian restaurant. There were two restaurants. restaurants. There were only two places that were open late at night, and one was that Indian. At, Shepherd's Bush Green, yeah. and the other was the uh, that Chinese restaurant that was towards 
Holland Park, the Mandarin. Oh, right. I only remember going to the Indian. Singapore Mandarin, I think it was okay. called. And, and it was literally, there wasn't, Westfield wasn't there. There wasn't anything. Oh, it was dead. It was a, it was a yeah. wasteland. Well, there was that wine bar, wasn't there, Albertine's, which <laughs> I always say it was always full of, like, there'd be an older producer. But it wasn't with, open late, right? No. When you were in there, there was yeah. always an older producer and a young PA, female PA, crying. <laughs> the older producer would say, well, I will, as soon as the kids have left school, I will leave my wife. Well, also the BBC used to have the the theatre on Shepherd's Bush Green where they did Russell Harty and stuff yeah. like that. Yeah, Wogan. Yeah, and Wogan, yeah. No, yeah. not Russell Harty, that was the Greenwood, wasn't it? That was ITV. Yeah, I think it was, or certainly Wogan. Or well. LWT. I, I did stuff. I don't think I ever did Wogan, but... Uh, God, it's a different world, isn't it, really? So You're smoking as well, by the way. I see you smoking. I've fallen back into the habit, but... Oh. Smoking cigarettes, weed. You're smoking cigarettes. cigarettes. I, I stopped. I haven't really smoked weed all year. I'm, I'm doing really well with that, but the cigarettes are very tempting. Um, I've got a good giving up smoking technique because I used to be a smoker. Oh, but yeah. But you have to bas- you basically realise that you only want the first puff for your hit of nicotine. Yeah. The first couple of puffs. So you light a cigarette and you have the couple of puffs you need, and then you cut off the tip with a pair of scissors. Hmm. And then every time, and then when you next want a cigarette, you have to light the same cigarette. So you basically suddenly, instead of smoking 20, you're smoking five a day, but, and they're getting increasingly disgusting. And then when you've got down to only having, you know, a few a day with that method, you think, okay, I'll just go a day and see if I can go a day without having one. And then if you manage to do three days, you've cracked the back of the nicotine habit and it's silly to go back. And then with three oh, that's weeks, great. it's out of your system. But you tell yourself that any time you want one, you'll have one. There you go. Then we'll have to leave this in. This is yeah, great. I might keep that in the show. It's a public <laughs> service. <laughs> this podcast is informative. And of course, now you can get a, a vape without any nicotine in it so in terms of the fiddle the fiddling around with your hands and yeah the, i've yeah. got that too i'm double fisting yeah he's got all that any any <laughs> thank you Lisa. so when i so i was telling you about the sort of no i was putting talking, on a show no i was talking about I was, well no well okay i was saying that there was an episode of woman's hour with oh, Emma yeah, Barnett, yeah. my secret girlfriend we won't go into that now and she was interviewing jennifer saunders and she mentioned as a kind of breakthrough moment in comedy for women the scene where in the party where jen no where rick finds a, a tampon. tampon in uh, somebody's handbag oh, um, yeah. that, presume you wrote that yeah, in fact, I, that was actually something that had happened to me as a, as a child, <laughs> with my that I'd found a box of, of my mother's tampax and thought that they were a, a present that someone had yeah. given to me, and I'd actually made them into little mice and put <laughs> put faces on them and stuff. By the time she found, them. so yeah. I did, and I was always. Um, my favourite comedy was always the comedy of embarrassment. Yeah. So, which obviously those characters lent themselves very well to. Yeah, it's a great scene. I mean, yeah. it is in many ways. The, I loved. I mean, I loved that episode anyway. Really, and I liked that. I, I was friendly with Nicholas Ball, who plays oh, yeah. Britain's voted two years running. I think Britain's sexiest man in the Sun when he played the detective Hazel, uh, which was written by Terry Venables. Or something. Yeah, it's part written. That's by extraordinary. Yeah, and I love the women. And uh, he plays. But I persuaded him to play. Professor Jim Morrison, and I don't know why I love that line <laughs> where he says, "Rick, oh hello, Professor Morrison, how did you get here?" And he just says, "In my car." But it's the way that Nick Paul says, "In my car," that I just think is that's one of my favourite lines. I don't know why, really. Yeah. Um, but was that in the? I think that was in the first series, was it? Yeah, that was. I, I mean, uh, was it or was it interesting? Or boring. But I've got. I used to when I was on the when I was on the 
kind of um, book reading circuit. The story I used to tell about that was that somebody had had, there are all the extras in that hired from an agency called Real and Proper Psychopaths. No, really. <laughs> Remember, they were terrifying, all the extras yeah, in that. I didn't and know they they'd come And they actually, um, you can, and if, this is again for you, if you watch the recording, you can see me on my hands and knees crawling off the set <laughs> to get away from the violence. <laughs> and I think they did actually, because they were supposed to beat up Neil, so they did. There was the police coming in. To yeah, right. They did, they did attack yeah. Nigel um, quite badly, I think. We were uh, very disturbed to discover that... Um, that the young ones was very popular with policemen when it came yeah. out, and it was like we, but we're so, we're so mm-hmm. anti-police, and you know we've called the ha- yeah, she's having to berate us with that. And, yeah, I know. I never minded that. I touring bands and police. Yeah, and and school kids. Yeah, well, you know. Yeah, I never had a problem with that really. So yeah, sorry. Oh, so, I know you were asking me about the process of of the recordings. So yes. we so we'd go in we. would We'd have a table read for the, you know, with the script. In the North Acton. In North Acton oh, rehearsal rooms. Darling, wasn't that just a Doesn't exist a anymore. Dream. So that's the first time I had, um, uh, what do you call it? Um, oh, what's that thing? Um, well, food. Yeah, no, but but because it had such, like, because <laughs> Larry, Larry Olivier and that would be rehearsing, Charles and Cressida in there as well as, you know, the two Ronnies. The kit, the canteen was actually really kind of gourmet quality. Yeah, it was a and lot better that, than egg, is it egg, egg Florentine. Is oh, that, yeah, with spinach. Oh, yeah, or oh, that was that thing on a muffin with ham and um, eggs Benedict. Eggs Benedict. That was the wow. first time I had. That was at North Acton, not wow. and because the the, the the canteen was. See, really I have a horror of egg white, so I never would have eaten. No, that. well. Anyway, so so we'd have a table read, and so we'd have a table read. At which point, we would discover that the script ran over an hour long, and then I would have a sleepless night editing it. You to, did that, usually me, yeah, to try and get it down. Ben wrote separately, didn't he? he would bring in, his... but, but no, by then it was they were all amalgamated. But that's so probably why they were so why they were so long. Yeah, when we were writing, well, you obviously live in Rick, but Rick, me, and Ben would have a meeting, and we would thrash out what we wanted the episode to be and what the plot was and everything about it. And then Rick and I would write an episode and Ben would write an episode and then Rick and I would amalgamate the two episodes. And Ben's tended to be very sort of dialogue heavy and have, you know, good gags in them and things. So we would merge them and then... um, present them as the finished scripts, which we would then read, discover they were ridiculously long and have to cut them. And Paul actually got us an extension so that instead of being half-hour episodes, they were 35-minute episodes um, because we just couldn't get them down any further. And then um, and then we would rehearse. Um, so, so, so that would be the so Monday. We'd come, in, we'd come into North Acton on the Monday. And, we'd, and then we'd rehearse, you know, Tuesday, Wednesday go to TV centre on the, was it Friday or Saturday we had the recording? I think we had the pre records on the Thursday and then did the, but it might have been Saturday. Yeah, we had either like five or six days rehearsal. Yeah. At some point during the rehearsal, someone would get an idea and say, you know, wouldn't it be great if we could have a sofa that turned into a coffin? And at which point the call would go out, Iris, get down. It was just what's going on at this point. Lisa's got this dog, <laughs> rescue dog from Spain. Who I'm the only man that she loves, she's but then obsessed she's obsessed with you. Obsessed with me, but then she gets overexcited and tries to bite my face, <laughs> and that is like every relationship with a woman I've ever had, <laughs> really, essentially. <laughs> so anyway, she's she's over the other side of the room now. She's she's looking like she's about to pounce, pounce, or start talking. Um, so we, yeah, it was about, we, we, we'd actually asked for all these things that we thought we wanted, like having two week rehearsal periods and not having a studio audience. And when we did it, it turned out it was a really bad idea because you, you kind of can over rehearse and you can also, we needed the, the studio audience for the atmosphere and timing and everything. But, um, because I've got this, uh, another story I used to tell when I was on the, the dinner circuit when I was on the book reading circuit was that my memory is that, that Rick and Aid want drunkenly 
She's biting me, aren't I? Um, <laughs> that, that, uh, Rick and I drunkenly said, wrote this line about, um, quick, let's do this before Elephant Head comes on and starts singing. <laughs> forgot about it, but it somehow made its way into the script. And so th- this company in Glasgow, who I think were about to go bust, were suddenly commissioned to make this Elephant Head. I have no. Giant rubber. Head. It's, in the, it's in the show. Then when it turned up, we're all like, what the fuck is this? Because <laughs> we'd forgotten that anybody would ever. And so it had to go in. I also remember that we had a character who, and we said somebody with a very long nose that we were imagining was a prosthetic. And then they'd cast, <laughs> just cast someone with a really big nose. And it was like, <laughs> randomly. <laughs> I um, love the BBC in those days. But, w- the, I mean, it was incredible, wasn't it? We had um, a sort of four or five man special effects team. Yeah. Led by Deg Barton and Johnny. Yeah. And um, you could say, you know, I want a brick that explodes. I want a, I want, you know, a giant eclair that's going to fall from the ceiling. And, you know, it could be in the script or you could even think of it in, in the rehearsal process and they would make it. Such a, well, I mean, it was a golden age, wasn't it? In that it really, it really they was. They had all this know, in-house stuff. They had there. a wig department where they made Next extraordinary yeah. wigs and costumes. I mean, it was, yeah. it was a sort of centre of excellence yeah. in lots of fields other than you know just acting and writing and making tv yeah, programs yeah it was uh, and... truly and i think I, you know people don't i think i knew i mean i didn't know it was going to end but i knew that we were that i really appreciated all that yeah. i think that, that that depth of support that you got really the from, the expertise and mm, the you know of course it's all gone now all sold off yeah it uh, yes it it really felt like I guess like old Hollywood, that it mm. was a sort of works town, that it, yeah. you know, that everyone there was the best in their field and, you know, and, and knew what they were doing, but also that um, that they were doing original things and that it wasn't just based on, you know, what had been the last successful thing or what, you know, a kind of focus group had told them would yeah. be a successful well, thing they were to really do. Brave, really I mean, there, there was no no way that we would get that on the air now no i think that's one of the questions that was asked really you don't think that that would it would, it would get made today really no i could because basically paul jackson who was a junior producer could go in and say to his head of department there's this thing i want to do and they and they would go well it looks like complete you know shite to me but you know i trust your judgment you know, give it a go. Yeah. And you can't imagine that happening now. No. And we had a huge budget, yeah. which is what you touched on earlier when you were talking about, about the, the bands. bands. So tell that story then. Well, just that um, we realised there was, we were, or Paul Jackson told us that if we went, if we went, we, we said, oh, we can have all kinds of things. We could have sketches. We could have, you know, music. And he went, oh, well, if you have music, um, we can be in variety, and if we're in variety, then we've got a much bigger budget than if we're in comedy. And so we came under the variety department, and we had um, originally it was going to be, you know, lion tamers and sword swallowers and all kinds of things. And I think in the in the first series we had a lion tamer. That and, was a mess. That lion tamer. And just thing. about, every, I don't think any of the other variety acts were anything other than bands. No. And actually, you know, it fit much better with who we were to have bands anyway in, the, in that sort of punk era. Somebody asked about who, how did Motorhead end up getting on the show? Well, because, well, Rick particularly loved Motorhead. You know. And actually, I think that. I and mean, you just told, like, the. the, the, the we like, just have. That a, department at the BBC booking or whatever. Yeah. Just get Motorhead. Well, and it was series two by then, oh, right. so it was easier. Um, so I think I got madness because I think I knew I might I might be picking myself up there, yeah. but I think I, I knew madness. And and we had you your band. <laughs> I guess that's right. <laughs> so <laughs> apologise for that. <laughs> the first um, episode we had Nine Below Zero, who I yeah. don't don't think exist anymore. No, they do. No, I was they? at a, I was at a f- book festival in Berg Hampstead at no, the weekend, really? and I think they just played it. You know, uh, which you know. Take, take whatever meaning you want out of that. And we were friends with Jules Holland, so then, you know, that, and I'd had the idea, and I think it was in Series 2 of doing the sort of 
Bob Dylan subterranean homesick blues. Right. I because um, somebody has another question is what were the damned like? I just remember the damned that one of them Captain Sensible. Captain Sensible, but one of the other ones that is, was the what? Chinese restaurant we were talking about. Oh really? That he was I standing on the table. Way. They were all really well behaved except well, Cap- they were... Captain Sensible, who yeah. who sang. Um, Happy talk on the table of the Chinese restaurant. Did that, he already had a hit with that. Or he'd had a, a hit with it, and the rest of the band didn't That's like kind of him because he'd yeah. had a hit with Happy Talk. Right. But I can just remember one of them that his wife worked in the booking office of British <laughs> Airways, <laughs> and I remember Dave him. Manian? I can't remember, but just him ringing his wife and oh, hello, you know, I'm just at work. And I thought, ah, oh, how sweet, you know. I would tell Andy Oliver, who's now, you know, a, a kind of yes. A, what, National TV treasure or chef. whatever yeah. that she were that they were the most um, disruptive band we've ever. Was she had. Rip Rig and Pony? Was yeah. that Andy Oliver? That was Andy. Oh, yeah. Really, I didn't know that. Yeah. I was uh, Nikita's mum. Yeah, because Nana Cherry, who was in it as well, for some reason couldn't do that Nana one. Cherry, that's right. Now it was Andy. Oh right, they yeah. were awful. Yeah, they were so badly. Be- well, I tell that yeah. again. Another story is that they're like, oh, all this bit, they're, all this drinks real. Let's pinch it, and I'm like, <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> Those are props. Yeah. We need them for continuity. <laughs> no, I know that. That was that, that was Andy Oliver. Yeah, I didn't. Well, that's just there's a scoop for your boys and girls. I think. <laughs> Bake what's she in Bake Off or Master Chef or something? Great British menu, I think, and, oh, right. and a lot of other things. Yeah. Um, yes, they were terrifying, weren't they? Really, they yeah, were scary. They, they were by far the naughtiest of the band. Somebody says, "What music was it?" Oh, that's a line of Ricks as well, isn't it? Is um, have you got any music? So a, and there's a music. My braces. Here's a rip rig and pony. <laughs> <laughs> Which I think is also a fantastic line. I, I just remember in the party when he came in and went, anyone here like the Human League or something? And then meeting them later and going, you know, was that, was that anti-human? <laughs> <laughs> they were quite touchy, weren't they, yeah. the Human League? Phil Oak, <laughs> Phil, yeah, Phil Oakey of the Human League thought we had a feud for years. Mm-hmm. Uh, I I wasn't aware that we had really. Maybe that's what he was talking about. Well, I, also because I, I was perplexed when I met him. I was friends with Heaven Seventeen, who had formerly been the Human League. League yeah. yeah, there's an interesting documentary I saw about the music scene in Sheffield, where all those bands are from, and it's filmed. It's like filmed on a tram, and so like <laughs> it's it's ridiculous. Really. It's like so the Human League will get on the tram, <laughs> travel around for a bit, talking about, and then they'll get off. And um, Heaven 17 will get on, and then they'll talk oh. for a bit, and then they'll get off the tram, and Jarvis Cocker will get on. It's a, it's, it's on as the, as they, the tram is as traveling the tram, and it through, goes time. through time as well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh, worth uh, seeking out, boys wow. and girls, if you if you want. Um, I guess we must have been going out at the same time as the tube. Was well, that, it was a little bit later. Beginning of Channel tube. Four, wasn't it? Yeah, did that go out in the first? Because we were always on the tube, weren't we? I mean, we were always going up to Newcastle. I feel like it must on have. The tube. Well, the young ones didn't come up. They, the BBC brought it out to coincide with the launch of Channel Four, didn't they? Yeah, I think usually we'd be plugging or you'd be plugging comic strip stuff. Because that's the other that's the other idiotic thing about me is that I was supposed to be in the comic oh, yeah. strip. And I refused. Well, you were latterly. I, later on, when I realised yeah. my mistake, and luckily they let me in. Unlike um, who do you think you are? Um, <laughs> really? Did you try and grovel your way back into yeah, who yeah, do you think? Yeah, they, yeah. I told them. They said, came to me the first series and said, and "I'm like fuck you." And then when I saw how popular it was, I said, "Oh well, maybe I'll." And they're like, "Fucking that! I've been you now, you twat." Really? Yeah. And also star in a reasonably priced car. I was also sniffy about that. Anyway. Um, because it would be nice to know. I mean, I know you. Your dad came from the Isle of Man. Yeah, didn't you, but... I thought, well, I could pay for it. You know, I really wanted it. Don't... Anyway, they won't have me now. I'm, 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 like so many shows, I'm barred. What were we talking about? Did you see uh, Dame Judy Dentures the other day? No, I it, didn't. it was it was really moving, actually. Really? Yeah. Anyway, we're not here. So she can she can plug around <laughs> fucking podcast. Um, I know Shaw Williams is on that as well. Uh, so what were we talking about? Oh yeah, we used to do the tube. Oh, yeah, my, yeah, I said I wouldn't be in the comic strip because I was loyal to the young ones. Like, I didn't oh, yeah. think we should be both on BBC Two and Channel Four at the same time, even though everybody else who was in the fucking young ones was in the comic strip as well. 
So I was being ludicrously you were being loyal, more loyal than, than the people who were actually showing loyalty that hadn't even been asked. No, or was was entirely inappropriate. And of course, that yeah. that, that left the door open for Robbie Coltrane because he got to play all the fat bloke parts. Oh, is that I think. why? Well, that's my reading of it. There is the awful. Although I don't know whether we want to. He was in the younger ones as well, because the reason not as much. But that, and that's the other thing. Because that we want... came from Kevin Turvey. That's where Robbie came from, because because Kevin Turvey was in a kick up the eighties, which was made in uh, Scotland um, right. by Colin Gilbert and Sean Hardy of Not Nine Put News, and and Robbie was in that, which is where we met. Oh, uh, okay, all right, okay. And there is also the other, the fact, the mic question, which is, did we, I don't know, we trust on this when we did the reunion. Uh, yeah. That, the, that was well, supposed to be Peter Richardson. Did we? Talk? Yeah, I don't know if we talked about it then, but it was. I mean, when it was written, it was written for Peter Richardson. And then um, Peter and um, Paul Jackson didn't see eye to eye. Very so they certainly didn't. So uh, it was mutually decided that um, that Peter wouldn't, play Mike and then I think um, Keith Allen was mooted oh. briefly and he had also burnt his bridges rather successfully with <laughs> Paul Jackson and the BBC um, so then we um, auditioned for it and I think it very was nearly it. cast Timothy Spall really? who did an absolutely brilliant reading but visually his face was too similar to Nigel's right. the sort of hangdog look so that, um, uh, I think it was good that there wasn't another comic. I think Chris Ryan was actually a good balance, I think, really. Yeah, I mean, it's amazing in retrospect that we didn't think, oh, why don't we have a woman or something like that? Yeah, that's for the time. <laughs> yeah, a person of colour. <laughs> yeah. Younger ones questions. Let's see if. Uh, well, right, I'll go through them quickly. Was it was this was a an old ones you know ever planned? No, not really. Oh uh, well, I was. I always had the idea of doing the middle aged ones. Really, maybe as a sort of one off for comic relief or something yeah. like that. You know, I thought, and I had this idea that you know they'd all gone into you know Neil would have cut his hair and be wearing a suit and you know. Vivian would be on his, you know, third marriage and sort of work in a hospital and, you know, still drink too much. But, you know, yeah. they're just, just the disappointment really of the usual disappointment of most people's lives and, you know, what they think they're going to do when they're 18, 19, 20 and what they end up. Yeah, know. I think it's better left. As it, I think we should have done mm. a third. You know, I, we should have done a third series. I think in a Christmas special. Yeah, well, the only reason why we didn't do a third series in a Christmas special is because because Rick had this sort of romantic notion yeah, that we were that we were faulty towers and yeah. that we had to you know do two series and get out and you know kind of keep it as a sort of in amber you know as a sort of before we stupid before we went too far, but I think we had a lot more we could have done with it. Yeah, I think we, we finished it too early, really. Um, you know, and given that we'd killed them all in the pilot, we did have, you know, the opportunity to come, yeah, to come back. Idea, yeah. It wasn't like we were tied to hyper-realism or anything. No. Who was the fifth housemate? Oh, um, everyone always thinks that's me. Mm. And I might start pretending that it was me, but, yeah. but I didn't have... Um, an equity contract, so I couldn't um, do it. But basically the idea was that the house they lived in was a student house and at some unspecified point in time there had been a party there and someone had, you know, just never left so that you had occasional subliminal glances of um, a woman with long dark hair who just sort of sat in the corridor and you just might get a tiny you know, I never noticed she was there I you really <laughs> I never knew it's like what fifth that I never I never knew I'm, I'm a bit snooty I never talked to her. did we who was she who played the part an, an, an extra alright uh, who yes. chose the bands uh, I would say Rick and me probably but I don't I mean yeah I, what's your favourite line from the series 
I quite like um, the rant about um, pig intelligence. Oh, right, yeah, yeah. And I used to laugh a lot at your um, the monologue that you did about um, the pig friends Trotsky assortment, oh, right, yeah, but that doesn't really count because it's your line, not mine. Yeah, well, no. So did you not write any of Alexei's stuff? No, he got additional material credit. and um, mm -hmm. I mean, yes, I did write some of his yeah. stuff when he was a character. Because all that Brian, I didn't write any of Brian Damage. Yeah, so that's all you. Or The Vampire. Or The Vampire, yeah, Harry the Bastard, yeah. Well, I or or Tommy Belofsky. Or Tommy, it turns out I didn't write anything at all. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> we wrote most of it. It's just when he went into a little routine. Yeah. So they, it was it was not written. So the bits where I'm, yeah, well, probably couldn't do that anyway. When I'm going, hello, clocks and all that, that's me. That's yeah. you just ad-libbing. Yeah. What yeah. about when you voiced the cat doing stand-up? I didn't do that. I didn't do For some reason, I wasn't off, asked to what, do any what of the What cats doing stand-up? What cats? No, the, there was the puppet cat. You know, remember when the, the yeah. cat, and it goes into a little stand-up routine about peas. It wasn't me. I didn't do that. I like peas, five peas, ten peas, twenty peas. Yeah. I don't know who did that. Yeah. It wasn't me. It sounds like you. I know Aid did. Aid was SPG the hamster. Yeah. I had a hamster when I was... In my student yeah. house, I had a hamster and named it Special Pat Patrol Group. Aww. And Aww. it's really sad. It died at, um, after a house party. Some asshole put drugs in its water bottle <gasps> as, a, as a funny joke, quote unquote. Mm -hmm. And uh, obviously its bloody heart exploded or something. And it was, it was dead the next day. It was heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. But it was oh, I, yes. literally pretty... Um, I don't want to say a young one's way to go out, but there wasn't really many drug references in the yeah. young ones. No, um, but, um, no, that's true. They weren't very druggy, were they? Yeah, what's up there? No, I mean, presumably Neil. I can't remember. Really, there was a know. bit with um, someone at the party, I think, or the one of the people doing the one of the monologues of "I'm 16." I can join the army, you know. Uh, yeah, and yeah, uh, yeah. And we, uh, there was also, you said about how we used all our friends, or all your friends anyway. In the uh, Rick Aid and Ben had been at Manchester Drama Department and had lots of friends who, you know, who were actors or wanted to be actors. Um, it was a kind of jobs for the boys situation. And, and we always, you know, and then when Dawn and Jennifer came to the comic strip and everything, it was, you know, how do we get everybody in that we know, you know. Yeah, but that was nice. I thought. Yeah. I know it's a bit elitist in a way, but I think having all your mates in. So I, yes, I say I got Professor Jim. I got Nick Ball. I think I got Madness. It was obviously very exciting when Terry Jones agreed to do it as yes. well because they were heroes. Yes. Um, uh, who else? Well, uh, Arnold Brown was it? Tony. Do you remember Tony Allen? It took months yeah. of negotiations yeah. before he could agree uh, something that would fit with his anarchist principles. And Jim Barkley. Did he have? He was the policeman. He was the policeman, yes, in a, in a, in a line that's and, now very And Andy Latour. Andy Latour, yeah, from and the old alternative. Pa Pauline Melville, who was. Pauline was in it twice. Maggie Steed. Pauline was Adrian's mom. Yeah. Yeah, so that was all very, that was nice, that, though, I thought, really. Linda was in the audience for all of the recordings yeah. and got a certificate. <laughs> you can hear um, Rick. Male's brother Ant has a very distinctive laugh, and I can still hear him. Yeah. When, you know, if I yeah. And Lenny was in Lenny. Oh, yeah. Lenny was in the episode. Lenny policeman wasn't he? Hey, no, policeman, postman. Oh God, yeah. Yeah, I said because he's he's got to hit the moustache. He said, "Give <laughs> yes, him a uniform," and they, and, Rick <laughs> and they says, think they hit. Them. Yeah, they think they hit. Them. <laughs> That's brilliant. Yeah. That's so funny. Oh, <laughs> it's nice to kind of. Yeah. When you've, you, that's the other thing is I haven't watched them for such a long time. Yeah. Is I probably maybe I would enjoy them more now than at the time when all you see is you know the things that you wish had come out better or you know someone saying a line slightly wrong. Yeah. But that, yeah. you know that was the other nice thing about the people that were in it is that they would enhance it with their performances. Yes, yes, definitely. Oh, the Oblivion Boys as well, Mark oh, yeah. and Steve Frost. See, that's one of my favourite lines, but just, I, I thought it was maybe one of their lines, I'm not sure, but, you know, that one, I, I really pissed my girlfriend off, I said something 
quite awful about the Pope. And and, and Mark Arden says, well, you know she's a Catholic. And he says, I knew she was. Yeah. I didn't know the Pope was. I feel like that's, I mean, that's a great gag. I feel like it's an old gag. Yeah. <laughs> Well, you mentioned you might want to do a, a second episode of this yeah. one day, but uh, maybe instead, or as well as, there is a very popular YouTube format is watching back shows people have made and, and doing oh. kind of a commentary or a reaction. Uh, maybe we could get together and watch some episodes. And, yeah, and, and, and... We, that's what we were kind of going to do on, yeah. on live. As, yeah. Well, let's say if everybody enjoys this and they flock back. Yeah. If we, if you get more viewers than you did on your previous yeah, podcast, yeah, if we if we quadruple the view the listeners, so it's up to we'll you, do, listeners. Yeah, yeah, it's up to you, people. We'll do a we'll do a um, we'll do a, uh, your ones part two. Hello, Talal here from the Alexis Hell Podcast. And just a really quick interruption, just to remind you that if you are loving the show and all the stuff that we put out on YouTube, there's a really great way that you can support us financially and help pay the bills and keep the wheels a turning. And that's by heading to patreon.com forward slash Alexis Sale podcast. That's right. You can go over to patreon.com forward slash Alexis Sale podcast and select a monthly donation bracket and pop us some cash, show us your love and help keep this machine running. And I'll put a link to that site in the podcast description. All right. That's all I got to say. Thank you. Patreon.com forward slash Alexis Sale podcast. Bye. Next time, I think we'll either go back to, we're going to, I think we might do go back to our A to Z of, of communism, do angles, or I'll just go back to calling Keir Starmer a cunt. Uh, but also, we should also cover me and you, Lisa. Why, an a to Z, why are you up to E? Because we've done A, B, C, and D. Who was it? Who were A, B, C? Well, A, I can't remember. A was anarchism with Professor. Oh, okay, so you're not doing P for all of them. No, no. B and C was Bolshevism and Communism with Professor Tony Collins. D was Democratic Socialism with a guy you may have heard of called Jeremy Corbyn. Oh, yeah. So I'm trying to actually manage. I to... thought we said that wasn't part of the A to Z, the JC episode. Jeremy, I've changed my mind. Well, I have to retro. Shall I go change the title of the episode? If you want. <laughs> okay, okay. No, no, well, that's should... You could have him for C as Corbyn, yeah, J as Jeremy. Yeah, Just have him on every other week. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but the other thing we should discuss is that um, me and Lisa are, um, Lisa more than me really, are, are practitioners of the ancient oh, yes. Chinese art of martial art of Kung Fu. And uh, we, we, we our, our group is also a, runs by a kind of system of, of filial piety, Confucian filial piety. So Lisa is actually, she's more senior than me. She's my older sister. I know. Alexi mother. has to bow to me sometimes. Yeah, I do. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Isn't that weird? I do. Thank you. Thank you, Sifu. It's, it's, um, well, you recruited me. Tiger really. Crane Kung Fu. Tiger Crane Kung Fu. And, um, you do, uh, well, we do, um, well, Kung Fu, as everyone knows, means hard work. And it's the Chinese people always think, um, get confused with karate and think that it's a made up thing, but karate is Japanese and means open hand and Kung Fu is Chinese. Well, Kung Fu came first. Yes. And um, there are lots of different, we're um, of the five ancestor styles. Um, White Crane is the last and most evolved and is a woman style. Yes. That's our foundation myth is it was developed like yes. Wing Chun is devised by a woman. Yeah. Yeah. Fang Ching Yang. Mm, um, that's, that's good. And um, we do a blend of tiger and crane, so, which we call tiger crane kung fu. Yeah. Um, under our teacher, David Courtney Jones. Yeah. And, um, well, you do it a lot now, don't you? Like three, I do. T- three times a week, would you say? Yes. Three, four times a week? Yeah, yeah. And training yeah. on Sundays? I, so I do, I mostly do the soft style, which is a kind of tai chi, but the martial art, I do weapons. Yeah. Well. You do, sword you do staff. staff, yeah, yeah. broadsword. Did you do any of the other weapons? Did you do the teepee when we had the... No, I still haven't really graduated. And Talal also, have you been going to your classes, Talal? Yes, um, what, but I'm, what I'm not... do you do? I do Shaolin Kung Fu. Um, it's got a Chinese name as well, which 
I can't. It's good. It's very. It's good. You can do high kicks and stuff. Think of right now. Yeah, my my Sifu says I've got very good legs. Have you yeah. ever thought of leaving and coming to our club? <laughs> um, in West London. No. Um, yeah, I'm in West London. I'm. I'd, I'd love to come for a visit. See how what it's yeah. like. You do it on That'd Wednesdays, right? We do Mondays, Wednesdays, and Saturdays, mm. and then there's also a Thursday class and a Tuesday on Zoom. My class is Mondays and Tuesdays, but I only do Mondays because I do, I stream my other show, uh, Vicky's World, the Dungeons and Dragons podcast on Tuesdays. But it's not, there can't be many podcasts where everybody involved could fuck you up. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah. right. Maybe some of them white supremacist ones, I suppose. The the problem is, I've never had to, I mean, I say the problem is, I guess it's a good thing, but I've never had to use it in real life. And and part of me often kind of yearns for a moment when I can try it out, but at the same time. But I, I like to think it's not just the violent thing that you have to use in real life but in general the kind of elegance and composure and movement is stuff we use every yeah. day you know like when i make a cup of tea i try to do it with yeah. precision and concentration and um and um, yes it it also teaches you how to train and learn doesn't it that that's the yes. you know, it teaches you about practice and hard work and perseverance and being fit for purpose but also i think that knowing kung fu means that you People, I, this may prove to be an illusion, but people, you just don't give up the victim yeah. vibe. Yeah. You just, wherever you go, you know, within yeah. limits. Um, you carry you yourself. Don't, you don't look like a victim, really. So nobody, nobody see, you know, nobody is, is inclined to pick on you. Really. Well, it's self defense, isn't it? So one of the ways to defend yourself is to look like the sort of person that shouldn't be attacked. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. And almost every routine or, or sequence we learn begins with someone throwing a punch at you. It's, it's very rarely begins with you attacking. Oh, yeah, um, absolutely. And it's uh, it begins with a block um, or, um, you know, a dodge of sorts. And um, yeah, so it's not something you intend to go out there. And I had, a, I had there was a bully at my school who did Taekwondo. And he was he was the opposite. He used to use it as a bullying thing and fucking yeah. s- intimidate and scare the shit out of me. Taekwondo is a weird one, isn't it? Because it's become a sport, so it's sort of lost a lot of the artistry, I think, and it's just a lot of kicking. Yeah, it looked terrible in the Olympics. I thought it looked awful. So many pads as well, kind of like yeah. takes away the whole. We we have a of lot it. of um, hand movements as well as kicking. Yeah. You know, like I think the northern styles tend to do more kicking than we do. Yeah. We're southern style. Yeah, we're from Yongchun. Yongchun, which is a Fuchan city of Province. a small town of like two million people. Yeah. It's famous for martial arts and vinegar. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. It's re- I've been doing it two years now. And to be honest, like there are people in my class who are much more, not just dedicated, but able to. They work nine to fives, and whereas a lot of the time in the evenings, I just can't go. So I don't think I'm on the level of you two. Um, I've only, you know, I've been doing it two years and only graded once. I'm on a yellow belt, but I, I really well, enjoy our, it. In I our really... club, we don't change the colours of, but we only have, um, you know, you once you've graded, you have if you do the soft style, the Swan Young, you get a yellow belt. If you do the hard style Kung Fu, you get a maroon belt. Oh. Um, if you're an instructor, you have a blue belt. If you're a child, you have a green belt, and that's it. Because the idea being that you don't want to advertise to your opponent what um, level you're at. That's great. I wish oh, they did wow. that in mine. Because I've been going longer than so many people, but they've all got more belts than me. But we're yeah. kind of yeah. equal levels. But I just well, the other the other reason is that you're you know you're competing against yourself and. Um, in ter- you know, in terms of getting better, and you know, and everyone has their own. You know, I'm I'm a lot older than a lot of people in the class, and won't ever be able to do some of the things they do. Um, but on the other hand, you know, I've got, you know, I'm very bendy, and you know, and I've got things that I can do. And I think that if you sort of try and 
you know, if everyone has different colours of belts and you're trying to grade just to get the next colour of belt, then it's slightly sort of, it becomes about the sort of instant gratification of the new colour of belt rather than yeah. improving. But I have I have um, competed in China. Yes. Oh, wow. But terrifying, Incredible. but fun. And I took my son, who's, who's ginger, and it was like, um, you know, being with a K-pop band or something. We had to get <laughs> security on the second day, you know, because hordes of people arrived at the hotel to, to see him and have their photo taken with the ginger. My God. Um, you can probably hear the ginger dog. The dog's trying to bite my face again, so it's probably a good time to stop. Thank you, everybody. If you enjoyed that Young Ones uh, slash uh, Kung Fu episode, uh, we'll always, we can always do another one. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Stop biting me. <laughs> Iris, Ow. get down. Ow. Iris. You've been listening to the Alexi Cell Podcast. This show is produced and edited by Talal Karkuti. Music by Tarbush Records. Thanks to Anthony Overton for the sound mixing. And to Audio Boom for hosting us. Please keep your emails coming in at alexicellpodcast at gmail.com. Goodbye.